And what are these elements? They are very basic. Assets, liabilities, expenses, and your income. You may say, hey, I already know all this. I don't need to learn all this in a 10 minute video. Well, when you will hear the details in each one of them and how they are intertwined and linked with each other, hopefully you'll get some new aha moments. Hello everyone, welcome to our channel. In this video, I'm going to talk about four key essential elements that are required towards path to financial independence and also to calibrate your wealth. But before I do that, a sincere request. If you find the videos insightful and helpful, please do like and uh, subscribe and share with your family and friends. We make these videos out of our hobby as well as passion to generate financial awareness and your subscription would definitely give us a lot more encouragement to continue doing so. Also do please comment on the videos and reach out to us with your own journey, ups and downs for financial independence. It will also help us to learn more about you and also make videos that are much more relevant to you. All right, with that done, back to the topic. So like the elements that we have in, you know, that are essential for our living, fire, water, air, similarly, and by the way, a lot of air here in Tokyo, sorry, so I apologize if there is any sound disturbance here. It's, it's a nice uh, spring day here, but it's very windy. So like those elements, these four elements are also critical, essential, and they sound simple, but when they are intertwined together, they can do wonders if you understand them properly. And what are these elements? They are very basic. Assets, liabilities, expenses, and your income. You may say, hey, I already know all this. I don't need to learn all this in a 10 minute video. Well, when you will hear the details in each one of them, and how they are intertwined and linked with each other, hopefully you'll get some new aha moments. And interestingly, all the four are not just financial, they are also non-financial, non-tangible uh, towards their own personal growth. We are going to first focus on this video only on the financial part. Maybe in another video I'll try and make a bit about the non-financial parts of assets, liabilities, expenses and income. So let's go into each one and, you know, delve into the details. First is assets. Assets are your belongings, material belongings, your investments, all types. We can put them in three clear buckets or categories. One is your liquid assets. The second is your investments and third is your personal use assets. Liquid assets are all your savings, that are not linked to the market conditions, that are easily accessible, and there is very little or no penalty or charges of using that. So this is the cash in the bank, the cash at home, your short-term fixed deposits. How much should be the liquid assets compared to your overall portfolio of non-liquid assets, let's say investments and personal use assets, is what I've covered in the formula in the previous video of emergency fund calculator. Hopefully, when you watch that video, you'll get a good idea on what should be your liquid assets. Generally, by rule of thumb, as you would hear in that video, you should have generally between six months to 24 months of your expenses in form of your liquid assets. The second bucket is your investments. So the second category is your investments. Investments, as the word says, this is where you're expecting your money to grow and also your money to make money in term in form of returns or income, etc. Unlike liquid assets, where liquid assets do not generate any value except the security, your investments should generate long term value and also provide you some form of uh, growth towards the financial independence. This is everything from stocks mutual funds, ETFs, real estate, uh, gold, crypto, all kinds. Keep in mind that unlike the liquid assets, the investment or invested assets uh, are linked to the market. So their 
prices and your total holdings in your investments vary based on the market conditions. And there may be also some form of charge or penalty uh, based on even market conditions or actual penalty of withdrawing those, uh, you know, invested assets. This includes long term fixed deposits. The third is personal use assets. Personal use assets, as the name says, is, is what you personally consume. So this is your home, your car, the bigger personal use assets, but also any collectibles that you may have of certain value, be it handbags or uh, watches or any other thing that has certain value to it. Just be careful not to put your real estate or the home that you live in as real estate as an invested asset. This is the home that you live in. So you need to make sure that you put it in this third category rather than this second category. Why? Because in general, you should be calculating your net worth by adding your liquid assets and invested assets and not your home. This many times sounds controversial, but it is the best way that you will have towards path to financial independence because it will make sure that you'll focus a lot more on your investments that can make money for you rather than just your house that you're living in. As I've spoken in the other videos, including the formula that I talked about in the previous video, typically the home that you live in should not be more than 30% of your total net worth, including the value of the house. I have quite a few people that I know within the, my network who are living in a house that is worth more than 70 or 80% of their total net worth. And they have this false sense of security that they are, you know, they, they've invested well. But in my point, they are in this uh, danger or trap of being asset rich and cash poor. So make sure that when you are categorizing your assets, that you're putting your personal use assets, your home in a personal use asset bucket, rather than in your investment bucket, definitely not in your liquid assets uh, bucket. So the second element is your liabilities. Now, many people have that misunderstanding that when you talk about liabilities, you should only talk about the loan or the debt that you have. However, in my view, it should not just be your those kind of liabilities, but all kinds of obligations that you also have. And these obligations are your contractual obligations. So put your liabilities in two definite categories. One is your contractual obligation. The second is your net liabilities. Contractual obligations are where you have a contracted obligation towards paying a certain amount of money. This could be repaying debt in form of a contracted obligations for your house, your car or student loan or any form of uh, debt that you have. But it could also be a contractual obligation towards an investment, especially towards unit link investment plan or long term investment plans. This, uh, this is important to understand because those long term investment plans, if you do not meet your contractual obligation, there may be certain penalties uh, that the uh, investment in authority may have towards that. Ideally, and based on our own personal experiences, my suggestion would be to minimize the uh, uh, investments into such products that have a contract of obligation on which there are penalties, especially these unit link investment plans, etc. Because what those typically do is that they take a lot more fees, their own fees upfront. And so your money is not making money except going towards your fee, their fees in the first few years. And then your money starts returning money. And on top of that, you come up with this bound contract where it becomes difficult to withdraw that. So understand what are your total contractual obligation, both towards repaying debt, but also towards your investments. And the second category is definitely all your liabilities. This includes your remaining debt for home, your car, student loan, or any one-off payments that you may have towards friends, family, etc. Again, here, why it is important to have that clear understanding of those recurring payments, one-off payments, is you should try your best to pay off those 
one off payments that you have because you don't want that sword of that debt or liability hanging over your head and that compounding interest hurting you. Also, a simple equation that is something which you should continue doing is your net worth, that is your assets minus your liabilities. Now here, again, it's very important that when you are calculating your net worth, you only take in that first element your liquid assets and investments and you do not put your personal use assets including your home as part of that network and then net worth and then subtracting the liabilities to really see what your actual net worth is the third one is expenses now expenses to put it in simple two broad buckets which i hope you are already doing right now is your fixed expenses and your discretionary expenses Fixed expenses is what you need on to, to sustain your life on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. This could be rentals, your utilities, your um, payments for any domestic uh, help that you may have, your school fee, uh, uh, university for your uh, fee for your children, anything that is a minimum requirement for sustaining that life. While discretionary expenses are the expenses that vary on a monthly basis based on you know your shopping your um, entertainment your travel etc now this is very important to know because this will help you understand your budget that how do you make your budget ideally what you should be doing is you should be making one is your worst case scenario budget saying that hey what happens if I lose my job and I don't have a job for six months. What happens to my expenses? What is the bare minimum expenses that I need to sustain myself? And again, here, you will need to rely on the earlier elements. What are your contractual obligations? What are your liquid savings? So that will all, and how will you determine your emergency fund? So this is how these elements interact with each other. And this is how they sound simple, but when you use them, then you realize that there is a lot more that you should be doing and can do from there. For discretionary expenses, my suggestion would be average out your expenses for the last five years, that what are your ex discretionary expenses that are happening? Because discretionary expenses, you will realize, will change dramatically. One of the big things that influences discretionary expenses and what I talk about or Seema talks about in our videos is lifestyle inflation. So you will realize that there is a certain amount of lifestyle that influences your discretionary expenses. So they can go up dramatically much more than the regular inflation. So you need to understand very clearly what is your lifestyle inflation by averaging and calculating your discretionary expenses for the last five years or more if you can. Keep also in mind that there is a certain amount of lifestyle inflation that is required for you to not just sustain your lifestyle but also sustain the social settings that you have. And that I will call is what is the lifestyle equity. So you need to define what is your lifestyle equity point that this is what makes you equal within, you know, your groups or peers. And what is the lifestyle inflation which is pushing your boundaries a lot more. This is again one thing that determines your path to either becoming wealthy or path to becoming rich. And that's another thing that is worth listening to that I deal with another video of mine related to the path to being wealthy or path to being rich. So in the expenses, budgeting, fixed expenses, discretionary expenses, lifestyle inflation, lifestyle equity. So these are the things that will be very important to make sure that you're doing the right things for this element. The last one is income. Again, it sounds simple. You know what comes into your bank, what's your net salary, what's your gross salary. But there's a lot more to that. Because there is active income, there is passive income. Active income is what you earn when you're actively trading your you know, time, your talent, etc. to earn money. 
while passive income is when your money is making money for you. Also here, you have to see that in your active income, is it just your income or is it a family income that is contributing towards expenses as well as your investments? Because I've also seen in within our network that the contribution towards expenses is joined or sometimes the contribution towards expenses is single while the income is double and similarly goes with the investment. So if you're in a family or if you're as a couple, you need to get into the details that is your active income single, couple, family, towards expenses and investments. Passive income is what your money is making money. This is how your assets, this, at least the invested assets, start generating money for you. Ideally, uh, the day that your passive income is enough to meet your fixed and discretionary expenses, that's when you've achieved financial independence. And as we keep saying in our videos, financial independence is a must. Retiring early is an option. One of the big trigger points for Seema and I to choose retiring early is because we realize that we've technically achieved financial independence both by that 4% rule as well as our passive income being sufficient enough to take care of our basic expenses, both average discretionary as well as fixed expenses. So in the income category, it, is, it becomes very important within that element to make sure that every year you keep seeing that how are you growing your passive income. And there is a video that I've de uh, done where I've uh, evaluated five different types of passive income. It is worth watching and seeing that are these the same passive incomes that can also help you to also um, achieve financial independence or at least accelerate your journey to financial independence. So in summary, as you could have probably heard and seen, these elements, that is assets, liabilities, uh, expenses, and income, they sound very simple, they sound very you know, logical, but when you start intertwining them, it can actually, and when you use them with the right strategy, it can actually accelerate your path to financial independence and help you tremendously towards also creating wealth. Both material wealth, as well as non-material wealth. So I hope you found this video useful, you found it insightful, and as I requested at the start of the video, my request would be again to subscribe and share this video um, with your family and friends. Till the next video, till the next location, hopefully uh, as sunny as this, but less windy as uh, Tokyo, goodbye from me. Bye-bye.